Well, as we concluded our lesson in 1 Samuel chapter 20 last week, we were as an audience to Jonathan and David establishing a new covenant between them. The covenant I'm speaking of begins with the 12th verse and it continues to be elaborated upon until verse 23 of chapter 20. And verse 12 begins, Yehonatan said to David, Adonai, the God of Israel, is witness. See, this is a familiar vow formula that accompanies a covenant in the Bible. A vow is not a covenant. A covenant is not a vow. Rather, the covenant is the promise portion of an agreement. The vow is the seal and validation of that covenant. In ancient times, this validation was to invoke the name of your God as the guarantor with the idea that if one of the parties broke the agreement, the guarantor God would take action to punish the violator. Thus, what we read here is actually in Hebrew, Yehovah Elohim Yisrael, Yehovah the God of Israel. Yehovah is the name of the God of this covenant. So let's reread a portion of 1 Samuel chapter 20. We're going to read verses 12 through 23. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, that is page 321. 321. Starting at verse 12. Jonathan said to David, Adonai, the God of Israel, is witness. After I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, then if things look good for David, I'll send and let you know. But if my father intends to do you harm, may Adonai do as much and more to me if I don't let you know and send you away so that you can go in peace. And may Adonai be with you just as he used to be with my father. However, you are to show me Adonai's kindness not only when I'm alive so that I do not die, but also after Adonai has eliminated every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth, you're to continue showing kindness to my family forever. This Thus Jonathan made a covenant with the family of David, adding, May Adonai seek its fulfillment even through David's enemies. Jonathan had David swear it again because of the love he had for him. He loved him as he loved himself. And Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is Rosh Hodesh. You will be missed because your seat will be empty. The third day, hide yourself well in the same place as you did before, Stay by the departure stone. I'll shoot three arrows to one side as if I were shooting at a target. Then I'll send my boy to recover them. And if I tell the boy, they're here on this side of you, take them, then come. It means that everything is peaceful for you. As Adonai lives, uh, I'm sorry, it means uh, everything is peaceful for you. As Adonai lives, there's nothing wrong. But if I tell the boy the arrows are out there beyond you, then get going because Adonai is sending you away. As for the matter we discussed earlier, Adonai is between you and me forever. It's interesting to note that the terms of this agreement are bracketed with vow language. The opening statement is, Adonai, the God of Israel, is witness. The closing statement is, Adonai is between you and me forever. What makes this a new covenant? The only difference from the earlier one is that it expands those who are involved. The first covenant between Jonathan Dave and David was one of loyal friendship between them. This new one takes another step and it extends that loyalty out to Jonathan and David's descendants, their future families. Now, I don't know for certain if it was intended as such, but I believe that this new covenant between David and Jonathan is a pattern for the new covenant that is sealed with the sacrificial blood 
of Yeshua. I've, I've taught often that modern Christianity has assumed wrongly that because we have a so-called new covenant, that the earlier covenants between God and Noah, Abraham, and Moses were rendered null and void. That the concept is that a new covenant replaces an old covenant. That is far from the biblical pattern. Rather, Holy Scripture demonstrates that each successive covenant is established not as a replacement for an earlier one, but rather it addresses other matters entirely, or it pushes the redemption agenda forward another step, or it extends the benefits and scope of the earlier ones. Now, just as there was established the initial covenant of loyal friendship between David and Jonathan, and now here in chapter 20, the benefits and the scope of the covenant have been extended to their future descendants in this new covenant. So it is that the scope and the benefits of the earlier biblical covenants that were made between the Lord and the Hebrews were extended to all the people on this earth. All the tribes, all the nations, meaning Gentiles. The earlier covenants of God were not abolished. They were not abolished. Of course, there were caveats that made it clear that no one could enjoy the benefits of any of God's covenants if they weren't squarely in his camp. And that meant adopting the set of heavenly ideals that when taken as a whole, the Apostle Paul labels them spiritual Israel or true Israel or the Israel of God. Now, this new covenant agreed to in 1 Samuel chapter 20 further assumes that David will be in authority over Jonathan someday. So this is where we see that the implied becomes the explicit. The shadow becomes the shape. We, as the audience listening in on this conversation, have had the benefit now for a couple of chapters of knowing that God has secretly anointed David to be the king of Israel at the same time Saul has been rejected. Now, while others who surrounded David and Saul may have had some suspicions and, and maybe a little speculation that something was up, in reality, only Samuel and Saul know that God has rejected Saul as king. And interestingly, no one knows that David was to be the new king, and that includes, up to this point, David himself. Samuel had indeed anointed David, but the scriptures imply that Samuel didn't even know for certain what the anointing signified. So, neither was David told. So, as we see this scene between Jonathan and David unfold, one must grasp that it was a combination of some kind of mysterious instinct within Jonathan accompanied by some strange and disturbing circumstances concerning his father, which caused him to conclude that David was soon going to be the king of Israel. And, and, and this had all kinds of important ramifications for Saul's family, for Jonathan personally, and for Jonathan's offspring. And the most immediate concern was that once David became king, that he wouldn't turn on Jonathan and kill him because that was a rather typical thing for the new dynasty to perpetrate upon the former one in that day and age. But even more to this new covenant, it required David to show chesed, fidelity, faithfulness, 
loving kindness to Jonathan and to all of his descendants. And the reason that David owed this to Jonathan is because Jonathan willingly forfeited his customary right to succeed his father to the throne. And because Jonathan put his own life on the line to show a greater loyalty to his friend David than to his own father, his father was getting very suspicious. And once again in verse 17, we run into this statement that gives us the reason that Jonathan was willing to give up so much and turn it all over to David. It was because he loved him as he loved himself. It's important that we see this in the dual context that's intended. The first sense of this is to express this deep loyalty, this connection of their souls through God, who is that common point of connection. Note how this connection between them has been established in much the same way as believers are all interconnected through Yeshua. And the second sense is as a political reality. Recall that we have discussed that to love can be presented in the Bible in a number of different senses and meanings, and one of those is to express a proper and expected king-vassal relationship. That is, it was common terminology for that era to say that a king loved his vassal and the vassal loved his king. In ancient Assyrian royal records is found the standard loyalty instructions that the generals of Ashurbanipal, the king of, uh, of the vast Assyrian empire at one point, that he formally demanded that the kings and the potentates of the many nations that he conquered declare. It said, Ki'i Napshat Kanu Latar Amani, which translates to, you must love him, meaning Asher Bernapal, as you love yourself. Obviously, this wasn't referring to love in the sense of, uh, rather, this was referring to love in the sense of cooperation. This was referring to love in the sense of acceptance on a political, not a personal level. So Jonathan was vowing not only to continue with loyalty and their personal relationship, but now also in this changed political reality whereby David would become the king and Jonathan would become subject to the king. This also means that Jonathan no longer saw himself as subject to his father. Because it's impossible for him, impossible for Jonathan, to serve both Saul and David. This, of course, is the playing out of a God principle that is going to be restated centuries later by Messiah. In Luke 16, 13, no servant can be a slave to two masters, for he will either hate the first and love the second or scorn the second and be loyal to the first. You can't be a slave to both God and to money. It is all the more so in a very practical sense in this case because it's not possible for Jonathan to serve both the legitimate anointed king, David, and the rejected anti-king, Saul, of the same nation. And yet, how much do so many of us who claim loyalty to Jesus Christ attempt to do just that? We intend to pull off the impossible dichotomy. Day after day, painful reproof after painful reproof, thoroughly convinced that we can stand with one foot in the world appeasing Satan and the other foot in heaven appeasing God. That we can simultaneously submit to our fleshly desires 
and obey our heavenly master in some kind of rational and workable compromise. Starting in verse 18. The plan for Jonathan to discover his father's true intentions towards David and for David to be informed of them is decided upon. And David's not going to go to the Rosh Chodesh, the new moon festive meal, and sit at Saul's table, which was his custom. But Jonathan will. And while Jonathan is gathering the information, David will remain in hiding, and then on the third day of the new moon celebration, he's to then hide himself behind a mound or a stone in the countryside. And Jonathan's going to come with some arrows and a bow, and a young servant boy. And Jonathan will shoot some arrows. And then he's going to send the boy after them to pick them up. And if he instructs the boy that the arrows are near to him, then this is the signal to David that he's in no danger. If Jonathan instructs the boy that the arrows are further off in the distance beyond him, then this is the signal that David is in harm's way and he needs to flee right now. Then the agreement is sealed with Jonathan's vow that Adonai is between you and me forever. It is understood that David makes himself part of this vow even though Jonathan's doing all the talking. Let's read a little bit more. Let's start at verse 25. We'll go on to the end. Or rather, we'll start at 24. So David hid himself in the countryside. When Rosh Hodesh came, the king sat down to eat his meal. And the king sat in his usual place by the wall. And Jonathan stood up. And Abner sat next to Saul. But David's place was empty. However, Saul didn't say anything that day because he thought, something's happened to him. He's unclean. Yes, that's it. He isn't clean. The day after Rosh Hodesh, the second day, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why hasn't Jesse's son come to the meal either yesterday or today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David begged me to let him go to Bethlehem. And he said, Please let me go because our family has a sacrifice in the city and my brother demanded that I come. So now if you look on me favorably, please let me go away and see my brothers. And that's why he hasn't come to the king's table. And at that, Saul flew into a rage at Jonathan and he said, You crooked rebel! Don't I know that you've made that son of Jesse your best friend? You don't care that you're shaming yourself? You're dishonoring your mother too? Do you? Because as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be secure. Now send and bring him here to me. He deserves to die. Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What's he done? But Saul threw a spear at him, aiming to kill. Jonathan could no longer doubt that his father was determined to put David to death. Jonathan got up from the table in a fury. He ate no food the second day of the month, both because he was upset over David and because his father had put him to shame. And the next morning, Jonathan went out to the country at the time he had arranged with David, taking with him a young boy. And he told the boy, now run, find the arrows I'm about to shoot. And as the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy reached the place where the arrow was that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan shouted at the boy, isn't that arrow beyond you? Jonathan continued shouting out after the boy. Quick, hurry, don't just stand there. And Jonathan's boy gathered the arrows and returned to his master. But the boy didn't understand anything about the matter. Only Jonathan and David understood. And Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David got up from a place south of the stone and fell face down on the ground and prostrated himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept with each other until it became too much for David. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of Adonai that Adonai will be between me and you and between my descendants and yours forever. 
Rosh Hodesh comes a few hours later, sundown, and it's time for this festive meal to begin at Saul's table. King Saul sits in his usual place of honor, the head of the table, where his back can be against the wall. And this was customary for royalty to sit this way because his back was then protected from a sneak attack. And, and he could also then look out over the room and, and better observe everything that was going on. And Abner, Saul's supreme com- uh, general, sat next to him as both a symbol of his being second in command and, 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 and as indication he was Saul's private guard. And rather surprisingly, the king said nothing about David's absence. Instead, we're told that in his private thoughts, Saul just kind of figured that David must have been in a ritually unclean state, Tameh, and thus disqualified to eat his holy meal. And we once again see how distorted the practice of the Torah laws had become. While Numbers 28 explains the God-ordained observance of Rosh Chodesh, we find that it is the priesthood that must preside over it, not the king, and that the sacred meal is for the priests, and thus must be eaten in the presence of the Lord, meaning at the sanctuary. There's no thought that the new moon observance meant that there was to be a special dinner meal eaten by the secular authority. And while there is certainly no prohibition against laymen having a celebratory meal for Rosh Hodesh, there is equally no authority to declare such a meal to be holy unless perhaps the meal contained a portion of meat that had been properly sacrificed to Jehovah on the altar. Otherwise, as is here with King Saul, this was essentially only some kind of man-made tradition whereby the ritual cleanness status probably shouldn't even matter under these circumstances. Newsflash. That which is not prohibited by God does not mean that what is permitted is necessarily holy. We don't have holy Christmas and Hanukkah holidays. Even though our enemies may have godless evil in mind, we also don't have holy wars against our country's enemies. If you want to know what's holy, check with God's word. In it and it alone will we find what is and what is not holy. It's a closed case. We have no authority to add or subtract from God's list, no matter how good or pious that cause may seem to us. But that didn't stop Israel's leaders, like Saul or later Jewish or Christian leadership, from trying to establish holiness upon their own authority. The second day of Rosh Chodesh arrived. Again, a man-made observance that was assigned a holy aura. And once again, David didn't appear at King Saul's table. And this time Saul asked Jonathan, what's going on? Why isn't David here? And Jonathan quotes the fabrication that he and David had prepared for just this occasion. It was, remember, that David had gone home to Bethlehem for a family feast and that Jonathan had authorized this. Well, that was just too much for the king. He flew into a rage and he cursed at him. And the occasion that Jonathan says David is attending is in Hebrew, Zeva Mishpacha. This most literally means a clan voluntary sacrifice. So the idea is that this family celebration indeed is supposed to follow the Levitical law concerning sacrificing, but since the Zeva is a voluntary class of sacrifice, it is here being coupled with a kind of annual clan-wide reunion of David's kinfolks because the bulk of the meat can be used by the participants for a festive meal. Now it's thought that there was actually an altar 
in Bethlehem at one time, as there was in many places throughout the Holy Lands. And this arrangement of several altar or sanctuary sites was not at all in line with the Torah laws ordaining only a single central sanctuary. But it seemed to be an accepted norm at this time by the tribes and the clans to have many. No doubt the priests protested this to some degree, but it appears that by now the priests had split up into factions and they had dedicated themselves to serve one of those sanctuary or cult sites or another according to their personal loyalties and their personal preferences. Well, Saul was so angry with Jonathan for allowing David to go home to his family rather than showing a greater loyalty to the king, he started shouting curses at Jonathan. And he yells, Ben Nawat Hamardut. He yells this at his son, it means you son of a rebellious woman. I like that. <laughs> This is an insult to Jonathan. It's not a reference to his mother. It's like calling a man a dirty rat. There's no intention of blaming rats for this man's poor character. But Saul does make it a tad more personal when in verse 30 he says literally to disgrace, to the disgrace of your mother's nakedness. It, it kind of makes that try to sound a little bit nicer in our complete Jewish Bibles. But again, Saul is not insulting Jonathan's mother. A mother's nakedness is referring to her private parts. The idea is that the female part of his mother where birth occurs has been shamed because of her son's disloyal actions towards his family. This is all very Middle Eastern cultural dialogue. Anyway, Saul makes it clear that Jonathan's friendship with David has been a source of suspicion to Saul, and now he claims that his suspicions have proved to be true. And then in verse 31, the crux of this matter becomes clear. As long as David is alive, Saul's dynasty, with Jonathan being the next line to rule, won't become entrenched. David is indeed a danger to the throne. And Saul is perplexed as to why Jonathan can't see that. Poor, naive Jonathan retorts with a defense of his dear friend. What's he done? He says to his father. And this further infuriates Saul to the point that he takes a javelin that he always has in or near his hand and he throws it at Jonathan with full intent to kill him. And the naivety, boy, that instantly vanishes. Jonathan now realizes what David's been trying to tell him and what Saul has been so openly demonstrating that the king wouldn't stop at anything to put David into his grave. So now everything's out in the open. Saul knew David had rejected him as king. Saul knew that God had rejected him as king, but he wasn't about to give up his throne to anybody but his own son. Saul didn't know that God had chosen David. Nevertheless, David bore all the earmarks of being a genuine threat to Saul's dynasty, so he had to be eliminated. Jonathan, on the one hand, was actually now convinced that David was the Lord's choice for king and that his father would do all in his power to prevent that from happening, no matter how blasphemous and rebellious doing that was. See, there's little discernible difference at this point between Saul and the Pharaoh of Israel's captivity. Jonathan was humiliated, he was angry, he was shaken, and he left the table he didn't eat. And understand that the purpose of this meal wasn't to satisfy hunger. It was supposedly a sacred meal before the Lord. It was a religious ritual, as tainted as it was. So to not partake of it was a serious decision that probably brought gasps from the servants and from the guests. And in what could only have been a depressed condition, 
Jonathan followed through with the plan. And on the third day, he summoned a young servant boy. He gathered his bow and his arrows. He went out to the countryside where David was going to be hiding. And, you know, three is, a, is significant, by the way, because in the Bible, three is symb symbolic of divine influence. Using the arrow signals they had agreed upon, Jonathan indicated to David that his worst fears were true. He had to escape the area immediately. And Jonathan dismissed the boy, who had no idea of this plan, told him to go back to the city, which was Gibeah. And once they were alone, David emerged and they bade each other the saddest of farewells. David positively howled in anguish. Not simply because he would have to leave behind his most loyal friend, one of a level nobody could ever imagine, but because his life was never going to be the same. He was now a hunted fugitive who had done no wrong. I mean, it all seems so unfair. All David had ever done was to spite Saul's wars, to defeat Saul's enemies, to soothe Saul's inner demons with music, and show him the greatest deference at all times. You know, I've thought about this long and hard. David had no idea that Saul was actually the one who better understood the reality of this situation. Saul and Jonathan sensed, they knew that David was destined for the throne of Israel unless he was stopped. David was totally unaware of this immense honor that the God of Israel had bestowed upon him so he couldn't understand why things were going this way. I mean, what a lesson for us. Like for Job, the things that happen to us in our lives may seem inexplicable at the time, but easily it could be the Lord working His will out through us. It may be that we suffer, but it also may be that we just don't have a need to know in God's eyes. This is perhaps the best definition of the, of the trials that the Bible explains many of God's followers are going to endure. We will be perplexed and confused, but will we remain faithful and continue to trust that the Lord's in control? Or are we going to melt and we're going to start incessantly demanding to know why, why God in our prayers and our petitions? Don't lose heart, by the way, if you've done the latter. So is David. In many psalms, as David contended with God in his prayers, he began with a pleading or a very fearful, Why? Why is this happening to me? But ended with a peaceful acceptance of God's sovereignty and agreement with the Lord's right to David's life. Well, this chapter ends with a tearful farewell. But that's not the meaning of the go in peace statement by Jonathan to David. Go in peace is a technical legal term that more or less means, okay, we have a deal. The matter's concluded, and the matter is that a new covenant's now in force. And that Jonathan kept up his end of the covenant bargain by warning David of Saul's true intentions and by giving up any right that he held to the throne. Now he reminds David that this covenant bargain is not only between the two of them, but it's between their descendants. And it was to be a forever agreement. Let's move on into chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. So David got up and left. Jonathan went back to the city. David went to see Ahimelech the Kohen in, in uh, Nov. Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and asked, Why are you alone? Why isn't anyone with you? And David said to Ahimelech the Kohen, 
The king has sent me on a mission. He told me not to let anyone know its purpose or what I've been ordered to do. I've arranged a place where the guards are to meet me. Now, what do you have on hand? If you can spare five loaves of bread, give them to me, or whatever there is. And the priest answered David, I don't have any regular bread. However, there is consecrated bread, but only if the guards have abstained from women. And David answered the Cohen, Of course women have been kept away from us, as on previous campaigns. Whenever I got on campaigns, the men's gear is clean, even it's an ordinary trip. How much more than today, when they will be putting something consecrated in their backs? So the priest gave him consecrated bread because there was no bread there other than the show bread which had been removed from before Adonai to be replaced by freshly baked bread on the day the old bread was removed. Now one of his servants, one of the servants of Saul happened to be there that day, detained before Adonai. His name was Dweg the Edomite, the head of Saul's shepherds. And David said to Ahimelech, perhaps You have here with you a sword or a spear. I brought neither my sword nor any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. And the priest said, Well, the sword of Goliath, Goliath, the Philistine you killed in the Elah Valley is over there behind the ritual vest wrapped up in a cloth. If you want it, take it. It's the only one here. And David said, There's nothing like it. Give it to me. And the same day, David took flight from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gat. And the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, king of the land? Weren't they dancing and singing to each other? Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands? These remarks were not lost on David, and he became very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So as they were watching, he changed his behavior, and he acted like a madman when they had when they had hold of him, scratching marks on the the doors of the city gate, drooling down his beard. And the quiche said to his servants, Here, you see that this man is Meshuga. Why bring him to me? Am I short of Meshugaim? Is that why you brought this one to go crazy on me? Must I have this one in my house? The first verse of this chapter really belongs as the last verse of chapter 20. So David got up and left and Jonathan went back to the city. And in the next two episodes, we're going to see a dark side emerge to David's character as he regularly employs lies and and deception to escape King Saul's assassination attempts or to more easily achieve his own purposes. Now, we're going to see in a couple of chapters that although on the one hand he seems to be cunning and careful and the deception was not intended as as evil, just as a means to avoid Saul and to save his own neck. On the other hand, his actions will prove disastrous to many innocent people as often happen when sins are casually committed. Verse 2 has David fleeing to know which is a very short distance north of Jerusalem. It's still in the territory of Benjamin. It's not far from Gibeah. And he goes to see Ahimelech the priest. And when the Bible says the priest, the priest, it's just code for the high priest. Ahimelech, meaning my brother is king, was the son of Ahituv and the great-grandson of Eli, Samuel's former mentor. He is one of at least two competing high priests living at this time, but unfortunately, Ahimelech was not the God-authorized line of high priests. Rather, he was from the line of Ithamar. And when David shows up alone at Nob, the alarm bells go off for Ahimelech. This is suspicious. And so the, the, the priest emerges trembling before this renowned warrior whose name the young women chanted in their songs. Why? Why would such a well-known member of the king's court travel unescorted? That'd be dangerous. Very foolhardy. 
Ahimelech has no idea what's just transpired between David, Saul, and Jonathan, but his instincts tell him something's not right. Ahimelech is also the brother of Ahiah, my brother is God, who is Saul's personal priest. That means David, who's always trying to think two steps ahead, knows he can't be sure if he can trust this high priest, Ahimelech. So he makes up a whopper of a story. Tells the high priest that King Saul has sent him on a secret mission. And in order not to arouse suspicion, the men who are with him, there's actually men who are with him, but they're hiding. See, they're hiding. And they're going to meet him shortly. So David asks for bread, which is one of the reasons he came here. Five loaves. If he told the high priest that five loaves were only for himself, uh, he would have known something was amiss. The high priest explains that, well, at the moment, the only bread available is what has just been retired from serving as the consecrated bread in the sanctuary. And the priest is speaking of the show bread. The law is that 12 loaves of specially prepared and consecrated bread are to be baked and then placed in the tabernacle before the Lord. Then every Shabbat, they're to be exchanged for fresh ones. And then the priests are allowed to eat the weak old loaves. Now this showbread was unusually large. They were loaves made from about 12 cups of flour each. Not only could no one but priests eat this weak old bread, but it had to be consumed at the sanctuary. What this tells us is that some sort of sanctuary was existing at Nob at this time. What was it? What did it look like? Nobody knows. Almost certainly it was a tent of some sort, not a permanent building. But again, the sanctuary at Nob was by no means ever referred to in the Tanakh as being the central sanctuary, the one where God puts his name. It was but one of several that had been built since the divinely authorized wilderness tabernacle at Shiloh, Shiloh, had fallen into such disrepair that it was finally abandoned. Now I think it's hard for us sometimes to get a mental picture of what this fact of the abandoned authorized sanctuary, this, this fractured priesthood, this competing high priest issue ought to mean to us so that we have a more complete picture of Hebrew society as it existed then. The best illustration I can think of is modern day England, Great Britain. At one time, this great nation was thoroughly Christian. But today, it's almost devoid of any spirituality or religion except for Wicca and Islam. The magnificent churches the beautiful cathedrals of England's golden era of Christianity are now defunct. They're either mostly boarded up or they become museums, sold as restaurant locations, or more recently turned into mosques. And this new reality has happened at a relatively slow pace. So the full effect of all this wasn't realized until people started looking around and the churches were gone. But it was too late. It's now considered normal. And only a few lament what once was. And mostly that consists of startled foreigners like myself. The young British generation knows nothing else. It pays no attention to this enormous spiritual void that has overtaken them. This was Israel at the time of David's escape from Saul. The religious situation was confused, was contorted. Who was Israel's ultimate human religious authority? It was once Samuel, 
But ever since Saul became king, Samuel became retired. So the answer to that important question, who was in charge, depended on where you lived, depended on who you asked. There were supposed to have been 48 Levitical cities for the priests and for the Levites to live in and perform their critical religious duties, all scattered throughout the the promised land and funded by the other 12 tribes. Never at any point did Israel attain that full number. Some of the priests and Levites turned to hiring themselves out to be private priests to wealthy families. Matter of fact, we read about this back in the book of Judges. Others gave their allegiance to tribal and clan leaders so that their uh, a ritual worship site could be erected and maintained so at least they could perform something that resembled the Torah duties that they were born to do and so they could make a living so their families could survive. Anyway, back to verse 5. The priest, pretty intimidated, offers to give David five of the consecrated loaves, but only under the condition that he and his phantom men were ritually clean. And David assures him that he and his men are honorable, they're on duty, and therefore they had abstained from relations with women, which would have rendered them unclean, and that's what seemed to worry Ahimelech the most. And the reality is, this priest had no right to offer common men consecrated bread, Lechem Kodesh. And the common men had no right to eat of it. But the rules were so loosely applied in this era that Ahimelech didn't have any serious problem finding a way to comply with David's request. Besides, under the circumstances, one has to wonder just how holy these holy loaves actually were in God's eyes. However, to give the high priest the benefit of the doubt, the rabbis say that he employed Kal Vomer as the answer to the problem. Recall that Kal Vomer is a theological means of balancing the light versus the heavy. The principle is that there were times when the 613 laws would conflict with one, on, one another. For instance, Lying is a sin. But if one must lie to save the life of an innocent person, what should we do? The example I most often give of this is of Corey Ten Boom in World War II, hiding Jews from the German authorities and lying to her government about it. The purpose was to save innocent lives. And her action was nothing short of heroic. But she broke the commandment to never lie. Also the commandment to always respect her human government. The rabbinical argument of Kol Vomer says that although it is indeed always a sin to lie, it's an even greater sin to help facilitate the taking of innocent life. Light versus heavy. Therefore, she made the right choice. Of course. The high priest had a hungry man in front of him who held himself up as representing the king on a crucial mission. And so compassion led him to love thy neighbor at the expense of, obeying the, uh, of, of, of disobeying the law on who could eat the consecrated bread. We're going to stop here. We're going to continue on with chapter 21 next time. Please stand. Thank you.